Um, I'd like to welcome you on behalf of the West African Research Association and Africans in Boston. I mean, we have been teaming up together for a number of years now around Black History Month. And um, I think it's a really great partnership. Our objective is to bring Africa into the discussion of black history in the United States and to honor and acknowledge the links and deep relationships that continue uh, across the Atlantic. So this year what we've done is organized an exhibit uh, by a number of photographers and is called On the Other Side of the Lens. And the idea behind this exhibit is to have photographs by Africans of the United States and photographs by Africans in the diaspora of Africa. So the exhibit is here at the Strand Theatre Gallery. It's open every day from 9 to 5. That is to say every weekday, Monday through Friday, 9 to 5. Um, the exhibit, not the same photos, but the same photographers, is also at the YWCA in Cambridge, and that's open from 9 to 8.30 p.m. Monday through Friday. And those are through the month of February. Um, one of the photographers who's listed in the program, uh, Christelle Rollins-Jackson, uh, her work is not part of the exhibit. Um, so that's a correction I wanted to point out. Um, I would also like to express our thanks, that is the thanks of Africans in Boston and the West African Research Association, to a number of organizations who have helped make this possible. Um, the YWCA, Boston Cultural Council, the Boston University African Studies Center, and the Daughters of Yamaya. Uh, just a few brief words about the West African Research Association, which I'm calling MARA. Uh, we are an international network of scholars and institutions who have an interest in West Africa and the diaspora, and our mission is to promote research and dialogue on West Africa and the diaspora, and to promote, promote scholarly exchange. We do that uh, through fellowship programs, organizing conferences and institutes. And here in the U.S., we, re we work on our mission by getting more information out about West Africa and the diaspora uh, to the larger public. So the exhibit this evening, uh, I think, is a really exciting one. And I wanted to um, ask Jocelyna Imatradi from Africans in Boston if she'd say a little bit about the exhibit, because it's actually Jocelyna and Stephanie Guerin, who's the assistant director of WARA, who have really put this together. And um, before I do that, I just want to say that we have a really exciting panel tonight. Um, we have uh, a number of people who will be speaking about the question, who is African? Um, Victoria Massey in the middle, Charlotte Lucien to her right, and uh, Abel Jassy Amado to her left. Um, but before we turn this over to uh, Abel, I would like to introduce Jocelyn and ask you to say a few words about the exhibit. Okay, yes, thank you. Hello, everyone. Good evening. So again, my name is Jocelyn. I'm representing Africans in Boston. I'm the event coordinator, and I actually do have my team member, Nabil, sitting over there. Um, so for the photography exhibit, uh, Stephanie was able to get African-born and people of African descent, photographers that went to Africa, different parts of Africa, and took uh, photography of different places, different events, um, different people, all faces of Africa, the African continent, and showcase it here for you all today. So I don't know if you guys got a chance to walk around. There are labels that do explain each of the pictures and who took it. And um, I want to talk to you also a little bit of Africans in Boston. So we are also a nonprofit group. Uh, we began in 2011, and we're a nonprofit that has a mission to foster the social, economic, and educational development of all of our members, and just then the, the cultural barrier between different African communities. That was really important 
to Vori and Negomba. He's the president. Unfortunately, he's not here. He's in Chad. But, um, you know, he was looking for a group when he came here to put all people of African descent, not just continental Africans, but diasporans, Caribbeans, and people of the Americas. So what we also do is um, we do a lot of social events. We do a lot of collaborations, like we're doing with WARA at different schools, having professors speak, politicians. We've had um, ex-politicians from Nigeria. We've had um, writers come and speak about their projects and books. Um, we help fund different, just a whole wide range of different nonprofits and projects. Um, so this is the second time that we've collaborated, collaborated with Laura for our Black History Month. As Jennifer was saying, last year we did um, a session where we tried to talk about including African history as a part of Black History Month and its importance, the connection, and how it's a missing link. You know, Black History Month and the history shouldn't just start from slavery. It should talk about all the important accomplishments and cultures that we have in Africa. So that is all. Okay, thank you. Um, I did want to point out that uh, the spring 2014 issue of the West African Research Association newsletter is available out on the table when you come in. And the topic of the newsletter is diaspora, West Africans on both sides of the Atlantic. So it actually fits in very nicely with this evening's presentation. So again, thank you all for coming out. I know that it was not easy to get here. Um, we hope that you will enjoy the evening. Um, I think we have yeah, one more thing. Yeah, so um, for Africans in Boston, before um, we get started, I just wanted to announce an upcoming event we're going to have for Sunday, February 15th. Um, we usually have once a month a social networker called the Tone of Sundays where we have professionals and students come out and eat dinner at local African Caribbean Latino restaurants and talk about projects. So if you saw the flyer when you were coming in, it looks like this. And we're going to be at Addis Francis, an Ethiopian restaurant at 6. And right before then, we are collabing with um, Fufus and Oreos. And Wara actually did help collab with one of Janice Obeki's performance a few years ago. She's doing a brand new set of her Fufu and Oreos presentation. And that's going to be right across the street from Addis Red Sea. And everyone is going to get a 20% discount if you use the promotion code Obeki20. So uh, now without further ado, I think we should get onto the panel because it's going to be very exciting. So I'd like to introduce Abel Jassy Amadou who is going to be talking a bit about his experience and also serving as the moderator of the panel. Um, for the discussion, um, there are, we'll be passing out um, index cards. So if you have questions or comments that come to you as you're listening to people, you can jot them down and then uh, the panelists will address them afterwards. So. Well, for our patients, we understand that we start a little bit off the schedule. We want to make sure that as many people uh, are here before we start the brief discussion. Um, my name is Abel Yaman, as Jennifer pointed out. I have two uh, great speakers today that are going to talk about their own experience regarding this whole issue of this African. On my right, I have uh, um, uh, Victoria Massey. Victoria, she's a PhD candidate in anthropology at UC Berkeley, University of California at Berkeley. Um, she studies the aspartic circulation of genetic ancestry specific information. So, very interesting topic. Um, some of you might be familiar with all of these new uh, stuff that uh, uh, people are conducting, trying to trace genetically the origins of many um, African Americans, particularly famous ones. Uh, she's uh, currently a fellow at the National Science Foundation, Foundation right? And uh, she'll be talking about this uh, issue. And uh, the other panel member is Charlotte Lucien. Charlotte Lucien is going to talk about um, connections between West Africa and U.S., correct? In in Haiti. And um, Charlotte is a founder and director of Asian Artists. Assembly of Massachusetts. He himself is an artist, an oil painter. Um, I learned, so I look forward to, to really um, see some of his, his work. 
he's a contributor to several Asian newspapers here in the United States, as well in the NATO. So, um, and uh, officially, he's a public health administrator. Um, so, given <coughs> this uh, brief introduction, I, I want to share with you some, uh, we can call it preliminary thoughts on this issue of who is African, who is black. When we ask ourselves, uh, who is African, who is black, or who is something, we are uh, dealing with the issues of identity. In, in, in identity, before we can uh, delve into it, I want to stress that it is some, something that is not static. Rather, on the contrary, it's situation, situational. Depending on the situation, you may employ one or another of your several identity. For instance, at one point in time, I may want to emphasize my uh, the fact of me being a male person. At one point, I may want to stress that I'm from West Africa, and so on and so forth. So depending on the situation, we juggle different um, forms of identity that we, we can. I like to think of identity almost as a, a car, as a wallet filled with credit cards. Depending on the situation, you may want to employ one card or another. But the point is, uh, we want to talk about who is African, who is white. And, and this, this is a very interesting in, in, in a question to have. Many politicians, African politicians, um, African intellectuals have asked before. I don't want to burden you with an extensive list of uh, people who have asked about this, but I want to draw some examples. For instance, Julius Nyerere, who was one of the first pre uh, major names in Pan-Africanism, the first president of Tanzania, he, had, um, he understood this issue of Africa, the sentiment of Africa, as something that is constructed from outside. So, according to Nyerere, colonial powers, colonialism in general, Europeans in general, are the agents of construction of free Africa. He states that we did not know that we are African before Europeans told us that we are African. So, pretty much I want to stress that one way of constructing identity is uh, from, the, uh, from the outside. But there are others like the Common Room, another great name in Africanism, that look from a different perspective, from inside out, how um, African, to be an African, or to be a uh, part of the continent, is something that is inside the individual itself. So those of you who are familiar with the work of Amin um, he drew extensively on the notion of African personality, first developed by uh, uh, Reagan, the great thinker of Nigeria in the 19th century. Um, I like to think of this issue of who's African in terms of a dichotomy. It is a dialectic relationship between relationship between the self, the I, and the other. To identify myself as an African is to be engaged in this um, dialogue whereby some are pointed me as an African and I am recognized to be uh, an African. So there is this double relationship between othering, by othering I mean how others uh, beside myself impose my identity as well as selfing, how me, myself, describe and classify um, uh, uh, myself as being part of this or that group. So this is a sort of, a, in general terms, uh, of uh, this issue of who is African. But I, uh, my, my talk, however brief, is going to be how does the Cape Verdean American community look at this issue of who is African. Being myself a part of this community, I want to understand how um, do we, in general terms, uh, uh, understand this whole question. Some of you are familiar with um, Cape Verdean Americans if, if you are uh, from Boston, particularly in this neighborhood. This is one of major 
uh, a focal point of the Ivorian community. Uh, there is a dense historical connection between uh, uh, the islands of Cape Verde in West Africa and New England uh, in particular and the United States in general. The connection is so strong that it moves to the late, um, late 18th century. And the connection is not only uh, in terms of the trade, just to remind you that right after the abolition of um, slave trade, the United States slave trade was abolished, the United States slave trade, mind you, was abolished in 1807, um, not slave, slave trade, 1807, and um, a vibrant, into what historians call legitimate trade developed between US and West Africa. And after, um, Cape Verde became a sort of a forward operating base for uh, traders of the West into West Africa. So, Against this uh, backdrop, U.S. created the first um, uh, consulate in West Africa in Cape So, given the fact that Cape was so important, in 1818, the first consulate was opened in, in the island of Santiago to represent the business interests of, of um, um, uh, New England traders. Um, So, uh, um, Samuel Hodges, who was, from, uh, who was from here in Massachusetts, from Stoughton, became the first consul. This is just to give you a practical example of the strong connection between um, Cape Verde and, and the United States. Uh, by the mid-19th century, this symbiotic relationship between the United States and Cape Verde Islands was reinforced with I want to just provide you with a bit of information that, uh, so we can understand this connection between the world and, and, and the United States. By the 19th century, we, we do find the first major wave of Cavaliers uh, moving into the United States. Given this connection that I showed you before, and the fact that by the mid of 19th century, and, and we have a vibrant whaling industry. From New, from New England particularly, they often stop um, in, in the islands and uh, they recruit many of, many of the, uh, the islanders to, to work on the ships. So, this, when we enter in the 20th century, we will find a small equivalent in Massachusetts, in Massachusetts in, in, or in New England in general. So, this small, uh, community, when they came to the U.S., they brought in all the cultural baggage. One of the major um, cultural components they brought in was the issue of race. And this is really interesting because it helps us understand still today how um, does Cave Verdes in general understand the issue of race and um, and the issue of who is African. As you know, historically, at least, uh, race in the United States is often perceived in sort of a dichotomy. You are either white or not white. You know, perhaps if those in the South know this better, they won't drop uh, You may visibly look like a white person, but if you are one drop of black blood, you are black. So the one drop proof is pretty much what look. It does not matter how you look. What defines your race, according to this one drop rule, is your ancestry. If you only, only you have like one of your um, grandmother or, or uh, grandparents is a black person, you are automatically classified as black. But those in Cape Verde, they brought in a what we can call Iberian uh, social thought on race. Portuguese uh, social thought on, on race, unlike the case of um, North American thought on race, was based on a continuum. It's not classified or not based on the issue of either white or non-white, but rather race 
is to be moving from a full blind person to a full uh, white person, and in between, you do find different categories like mulatto, pardo, mestizo, and so on and so forth, depending on the combination of these two races. So, what we find is when um, um, difference came to the United States, they came with this notion that race are classified in a continuum. But here you are, they confront or at least they face the issue that you are either white or black. So, this became the first um, uh, dilemma of, of favoring Americans in, in, in messages. How to deal with these two different perspectives of race? There is an interesting book by a modern author, and the title is quite suggestive, and it, it helps us understand this uh, dilemma. It's uh, uh, between race and ethnicity. The idea that um, Kavarians understood itself not to be part of blackness, so that did not identify itself as black as an African, and I will explain this, the reasons behind this. At the same time, the mainstream society did not recognize them as uh, uh, non-African. So while mainstream was looking at them as African, they shield themselves from being classified as such. One of the reasons that um, uh, uh, even Americans argue for non-Africanness is, uh, uh, we may want to say, a sort of a social status. To equate with being African was to equate in light of the colonial uh, thought that was prevalent at this time, we're talking about early 20th century, is to recognize oneself as being inferior. Remember that we're talking that the old colonial development and the old colonial ideology according to which you do find a hierarchy of civilization whereby the European civilization is at the peak and African at the bottom and, and the colonial ideology was fundamentally binary, primitive, versus uh, advanced, traditional versus modern, uh, uh, backward versus um, uh, um, advanced. So Africa represented all the, the, the negative side of this um, equation. So for, for um, the givers, once they, they came to the US, they did find the same similar uh, situation. So by linking themselves with the uh, um, African Americans, uh, it was almost like recognizing the inferiority. What happened is the community as a whole preferred to isolate from the mainstream, the mainstream white society, as well from the African American. So this is the first, the first uh, uh, period. I, um, I want to just skip to another uh, period, so then moving forward some 50 years, in the 1950s, 1960s, where things start to become rather interesting. The second and third generations of people in America, they start to deal with uh, all issues, and they understood, and many of them understood, that um, they had to face, uh, um, they had to face this whole um, issue of race. So, pretty much, in the 1960s, given the aura of the time, so the zeitgeist that Germans like to talk about, the spirit of the ages, you know, we're talking about the era of civil rights movement, the era that um, um, African Americans decided to fully embrace their identity and to demand to be respected by, uh, uh, by the mainstream society here in the United States. So what we find is uh, uh, the younger generation of African Americans began to embrace the African identity. I'm just going to provide with two examples. Uh, there is a, a, a one um, branch of it um, uh, that began, for instance, to work with the movement of the Malcolm X, one of the, the person actually I interviewed some years ago uh, from uh, New Bedford. 
second generation paper. He was first uh, um, uh, part of the Malcolm X um, uh, uh, church, so to say. And uh, he would later, in the late 1960s, he went back to, to Africa, particularly to Guinea Conakry, where uh, the liberation struggle for um, the defense of Hitler was being uh, had for. This is one of the branches. And the second branch that embraced, the second branch of Hitler and that, is that embraced um, 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 African identity can be illustrated with the example of another person from New Bedford, uh, uh, Parky Brace. Parky Brace had an interesting history because he became the first non-African American leader of Black Panther's Party chapter. So the, the chapter of Black Panther's Party in New Bedford was led by this um, people in America. So, and uh, as you know, the key com ideological component of, of uh, Black Panther's Party uh, was an Africanism, the idea of emphasizing um, blackness and emphasizing the African connection. Okay? So now what we find, we do find this uh, again another uh, 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 dilemma. This dilemma has become generational. The old given um, Americans still locked in the past do not recognize themselves as Africans or at least want to distance themselves while some of the young generation fully embrace the Pan-African identity and they, um, and, they, and, and they uh, uh, belong into this wider community that stretches beyond the U.S. So they become part of this transnational public sphere of blackness that link folks here in the United States, in Africa, in the Caribbean particular. So, um, and to conclude, and perhaps uh, I don't want to take much of the time because uh, I'm here to moderate and I want to provide more time for the, those who are going to actually speak and to conclude, I, I want to uh, briefly uh, summarize that what we find today among the Cape community is basically three major uh, branches. The first, very small uh, um, part of the community particularly the old generation, are still locked in this idea that to speak about, about Cape Verde, to speak about Cape Verde culture, or to speak about Cape Verde uh, people, is to look basically at the European heritage, the idea that um, Cape Verde is still part of the Western civilization, and then you have the two major uh, um, other components, the other being the uh, emphasizing African identity, so the idea that Giver is fully uh, African. And lastly, we have what we may call um, the Atlanticist um, um, identity. The, uh, those who argue that we are neither African nor European, we are simply um, Giver. So my, my, my talk is to was is to, to look at history, how this different debate on identity and how the community uh, uh, look at themselves vis-a-vis -vis this issue of Africa and how um, did Cuban Americans respond to the questions they pose to themselves. And uh, we are not conclusive, or well, I should say that the debate is still going on. We still find that different sections of the community defending one, uh, one, uh, may call it one component of identity over the other. So, with that in mind, um, perhaps I should uh, uh, stop here so I can give opportunity to others to uh, express their thoughts on this issue. And uh, if the audience have any questions, we can come back later on and uh, I, I will uh, respond to your questions. Okay? So I will... I will pass the word to um, Sharon. Thank you and uh, good evening and thank you for being here again. So some of the questions on the table have to do with uh, defining the concept of uh, blackness or who is uh, African. To help me do that, I'll go on some kind of tour quickly of uh, Haitian history. I'll use uh, some uh, elements of uh, Haitian literature 
as a well. I'll uh, review uh, quickly the concept of uh, negritude, blackness to speak, as uh, it uh, emerged both in Haiti and in some uh, Caribbean islands and how it connected at some point with the Harlem Renaissance movement of the uh, 30s. And I will finally attempt to answer the questions. Uh, am I Af African? Now, that will actually come up with some uh, a personal touch, not speaking on behalf of the community per se. Now, if we have to talk about uh, ID TV, uh, and I have to narrow down my presentation given the time uh, is time. So, we obviously have to understand that, uh, speaking about Haiti, we need to remember that uh, most of those slaves who ended uh, in Haiti between 1503 and up to the late uh, 1790s came from the west coast of uh, Africa. Uh, Benin, Nigeria, Senegal, Congo, Togo, Guinea, Ivory Coast, and later there will be some connection between uh, Haiti and uh, Congo, in particular, in the uh, 60s, 1960s. So you talk about, uh, again, uh, Haiti. You think uh, not only of this part of history, where, again, most Haitians came from uh, the west, west coast of Africa, but you also think about the cultural uh, background, whether you evoke the Haitian language that still have some elements of uh, form or Iwi. <coughs> whether you think about uh, the drone that has been used in Haiti, not uh, only as a religious instrument, but also an instrument that was used to help uh, promote uh, the revolution. When I say religious, I'm speaking specifically talking about uh, voodoo. And uh, if you also think about uh, the best known Haitian style of painting, the so-called Haitian naive painting or primitive painting, as of today, they are still reflecting things that do not exist in Haiti. The African jungle, those lions, those tigers are often found in uh, Haitian primitive painting. And we see this as uh, the preservation of the African ancestry throughout uh, the decades or throughout uh, the centuries. So the cultural uh, element also indicates again this uh, communion, this uh, connection to Africa. Now one has, one has to remember that after Haiti's independence in 1804, the revolutions lasted between 1791 and 1804. Right after Haiti's independence, although it was a violent and brutal fight, battle against the French armies and their allies, but the Haitian elites embraced this pro-Western this pro-French mode and way of uh, living. And there could be several complex explanations for that. You can uh, maybe think about those uh, psychological ones. It's about this complex mental enslavement that took place between 1503 up to 1803. That's one example, one way to think of it. You can think also of more pragmatic reasons where the Haitian government Independence because that would have been a bad example to other nations. If you go back to Alex Ali's route, you will see that uh, indeed there are several illustrations where in the South they were trying to prevent slaves from learning or hearing about the Haitian Revolution so that they wouldn't emulate the same uh, movement. Uh, there was also, for example, the use of uh, Catholicism that was uh, used to face uh, voodoo or to eliminate, uh, to prevent the use of voodoo by the former slaves. You can also think both of the educational system that was in fact sustained mostly by either French teachers or educators who were on the side of the Haitian Revolution because of their liberal leaning following the French Revolution or by a Catholic priest as well. Even the whole legal system was also uh, based on French era Napoleon code. So on one hand, you had a revolution that expelled the French from the country. On the other hand, you still have structures and infrastructures and legal structures and educational, educational structures that were there to uh, ensure the continuation 
of this uh, mental or cultural enslavement. However, two things were going to be very clear and very constant. The Haitian independence made the case that Haiti's independence was totally irreversible. There will never be any kind of French colonization in Haiti. The second piece was that anybody who was in Haiti, regardless of your skin, skin color, if you intended to be enjoying your civil and political rights, you were black. So that was clearly labeled into the constitution. Whoever resided in Haiti, regardless of your background, you were considered and you were defined to be black. Which is why to this day, someone in Haiti is always called a black man, or the stranger or the foreigner who traveled in Haiti is called Neg Sa. Equals Neg equal to just being a person. It's not about being black or white. So through its existence, there have been significant other moments where Haiti or Haitian elites, when I say elites, the more uh, liberal or the more progressive ones, attempted to clearly identify their Haitian uh, ancestry. For example, toward the end of the 19th century, a famous French anthropologist, that would be the Comte Arthur de Bobineau, has been very popular making the case that blacks were closer to monkeys, looking at the whole series of unscientific observation or data that were at that time presented as scientific, including that if you measure the facial angle of a black person and compare it to the facial angle of a monkey, it was similar, those kind of things. So against this theory that was very popular because it was again backed up by the scientific anthropological <coughs> Cobino, a very famous Haitian intellectual, Antinor Firmin, would write in 1885 of the, the legality de race humaine, of the equality of human race. And this was to refute Arthur de Gobineau's strongly accepted book of the inequality of human race. So Antinor Firmin would present uh, this particular thesis at uh, La Sorbonne in Paris in 1885. I want to tell you that about uh, 10 years ago, uh, the Chicago Press, uh, University Press of Chicago, uh, translated this book and then put it into English. It's now available on the equality of human race. Antinofia is now viewed as the father of modern black anthropology. So that was one clear attempt of Antinofia, not only to refute Gobino, but to do so, he had to call onto his African ancestry the value of our traditions, what Haiti has accomplished in order to demonstrate that there was nothing wrong about, about being black. I want to point out, by the way, that at some point, Antinor Fiamme became a good friend with Frédéric Douglas, who was the second black ambassador in Haiti, and they kind of connected, and that would lead to uh, the US not being able to put its hands on the Mont saint Nicolas on the eastern part of Haiti that was supposed to be what we have today, the Guantanamo Base. And that was thanks to this connection between Antonio Fiume and uh, Frédéric Douglas in the late 1890s. So moving along after Antonio Fiume, the second strong movement that would further identify Haiti as a, or call on Haiti's African ancestry to identify itself took place between the 1920s. Haiti was occupied by the U.S. from 1915 up to 1934. Shortly after the U.S. Marines landed in Haiti in 1915, the U.S. military leadership started to refer to Haitians as those monkeys speaking French. Because clearly what they saw were the Haitian elites proudly displaying their ability not only to speak French, to write wonderful pieces in French, poetry in French, and to be able to play uh, French or European uh, music back in. This is what was happening in the uh, living rooms of the Haitian elites. So once the Haitian elites started to notice that regardless of their dark skin or light skin, different shades, mulatto, they were all viewed the same by the arrogant Marines, a lot of them from the South, but then they started to actually refer to return to their African roots. So the major 
book publication that will come out of this period in uh, 1928 came from Jean Price Marx and his book was called So Spoke the Uncle in French Ainsi par la langue. So So Spoke the Uncle was a metamorphic way to call on the concept of the African griot that would actually share information about its ancestry, past civilization, the, genea genea uh, the gene genealogy of a particular family, and then tell the nephews and the sons and the daughters about who they were, what made them great, their kings, their friends, the past African civilizations. So, so spoke the uncle, and si bon la was a masterpiece of anthropology as well. And out of this book, Jean Price Mars was going to develop a strong following of Asian scholars and uh, intellectuals, and they are going to create the indigenous movement. The movement indigenous, again, indigenous would refer to the locals. So, both Jean Price Mars would at some point develop this following. And this following would include, later on, Haitian uh, intellectuals who traveled to Paris, who met with Leopold Sidar Senghor, who met with uh, Aimé Césaire. Both of them would make clear statement that Haiti was the first place where Negritude, Negritude's blackness, would step for the first time in 1804. At some point, there would be some uh, intellectuals, Langston Hughes, or Richard Wrights. Some of them had connections to some, Paris, uh, some Africans and Caribbeans in Paris and would meet in Paris. So there would actually be the connection between the Haitian immigrant movement and the Black is Beautiful movement of the Harlem Renaissance. So I think if you continue through history, you'll find names such as uh, Catherine Bernhardt, for example, who had traveled in the Indian African dance, come back here to make them more popular. If you're also talking about blackness, you'll find that Alvin, Alvin Ali didn't go to Haiti, but clearly he embraced African and Caribbean dances and then made, made them popular here in the, uh, the US. So this is to say that there have been both movements throughout Haitian history and literature. They're having connections between Haitian and Caribbean intellectuals to help define this movement. However, I don't think that uh, in the end, Haitians would necessarily define themselves as being African. Over time, there have been accumulation of factors, either the attempt by the international community to prevent Haiti from becoming this independent country because of international geopolitical tensions. So all of those other experiences will add a special blend that will make them unique, however, while conserving and praising and embracing their African roots. So I would say without being, again, speaking, without speaking about the Asian community or on behalf of the Asian community, my point is that today there is uh, this uh, mosaic of blackness that is made of both being of African ancestry, but also a unique geopolitical reality that actually helps us define who we are. And I think that this is something that we have to embrace and it's only by acknowledging that there are differences within this so-called blackness or this African ancestry that we can further learn about others, about the struggles of African Americans here in the US or Africans here in the United States, and then further solidify this networking for this collaboration. Thanks. Thank you. So now we are going to listen to Victoria. Hi everybody, how's everybody doing? <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to do something, um, so my, my, my talk today is going to be less about the history, so much more so about kind of the present conditions I'm kind of dealing with with how these connections are happening, um, just via DNA ancestry, so, um, okay. So, over the past decade, genetic ancestry testing has become an American pastime. In 2008, technology made headlines in the New York Times style section as people gathered together in suits and cocktail dresses for a spit party during New York Fashion Week, hosted by 23andMe, a DNA ancestry testing company based in Silicon Valley. Four years later, a Groupon deal circulated around the San Francisco Bay Area for DNA self-portraits on canvas. 
For a 64% discount, science and art were fused together as biochemists transformed a gel electrophoresis scan into ready-to-hang ready to wall art made by a group of graphic designers. More recently, genetic ancestry made an appearance in the latest season of supermodel Tyra Banks' reality TV show America's Next Top Model. Did anybody else watch that? Is it just me? Okay. <laughs> Um, like seasons past, the models in the making huddle together in the center of the salon, anticipating the news of their respective makeovers. After each haircut, weave in, and hair dyeing possibility had been announced, Tyra had yet another surprise, a DNA test. Tyra posed to the contestants, we think we know who we are, but what are you? These transformations were to extend beyond their exterior. Tyra, like the New York Spit Party and the Bay Area Groupon deal, was using genetic ancestry testing as a means of presenting another form of revisioning self, one hidden within that has yet to be revealed and whose revelatory form has the potential to be manifold. Accordingly, what are we to make of these emerging entanglements? Often, in, or at least in scholarly circles, genetic ancestry testing has been, anchored, has been discussed as being anchored in the scientific techniques deployed in the creation of ancestry informative markers that suggest that reference American racial categories and make it uh, situate DNA as a new stage on which we may be witnessing the reification of race at a genomic level. Yet, as the terrain on and through which ancestry circulates and is mobilized shifts, how might we be forced to rethink the terms for defining ancestry and race, the relation between the two, and the processes according to which reification of racial identities may or may not be possible? It becomes a question of how do we use DNA to, as a site, as, a, as the source for authenticating these identities? Um, from mitochondrial DNA, autosomal DNA, to the Y chromosome, genetic ancestry testing is instructed as a tool to answer the question, who am I, often in terms of a simultaneous demand for information on where am I from. However, in what ways might these questions remain undetermined long after the results of the DNA test have been given? Specifically, how might it be nece become necessary to reformulate the position of DNA as a root of ourselves in terms of the various roots it takes? How might these changes reflect a similar transformation in how we understand the racial identities ostensibly solidified according to it? These are often the questions I have to raise for my own research. Though I noted earlier the popularity of genetic ancestry, it's impossible to deny the particular interest African Americans have taken with this form of genetic testing. Demonstrated by Dr. Henry Louis Gates Jr.'s PBS documentaries, African, African American Lives 1 and 2, came out in 2006 and 2008, respectively. Have any of you seen that? It was with Oprah and Chris Rock and everybody. Okay. Um, in addition to the launching of companies like African Ancestry Incorporated <laughs> and African DNA, this technology has become a tool for African Americans to discover African origins that have often eluded them in conventional genealogical research. Over the course of the past few months that I've been working with African American genealogists at the Washington DC Family History Center, I've learned one rule, document everything. While many come to the center to make sense of family stories, these stories are, regard, are to be regarded as being tr as true as they are false. The stability of any node of, each, of any segment of one's gene genealogical tree can never be fully guaranteed until one has gathered documents to substantiate it. However, the legacy of slavery still lingers, particularly in the fact that we were are we are often unable to name we were made unable to name ourselves. Unlike other ethnic and racial groups in the United States, African Americans who are descendants of Africans enslaved in the Americas typically find themselves confronted with a dearth of archival materials, a consequence of the systematic denial of our ancestors' legal and social personhood. Yet, one trace of material remains one that has connected one generation to the next, DNA. As a result, DNA has emerged as a tool for rebuilding a bridge to a home across the Atlantic that, has once, that was once thought to have been unrecoverable. The process of rebuilding, however, has not been unidirectional. West African countries have been using genetic ancestry as a means for establishing ties with their genetically identified diaspora. For example, um, Sierra Leone in 2008 offered dual citizenship to actor Isaiah Washington based on his genetic ancestry testing results. In this instance, <laughs> genetic ancestry signifies not only kinship, but state-recognized alliances across the Atlantic. Consequently, as genetic ancestry information reroutes home outside of our bodies and beyond American national boundaries, new sets of political, social, economic, and historical factors come to influence the terms of one's presumed biological inheritance. Um, and that's, for the most part, what I've had to kind of confront with my field merchants to Cameroon. 
um, beginning the day after Christmas in 2011. Uh, the year prior, in 2010, Cameroon made headlines as the first African nation to host a delegation of African Americans in a genetically certified country of origin through what came to be known as the Ancestry Connection Program, or the ARP. So I was going to say for it bigger than this. Um, largely developed by a U.S.-based NGO of musicians, many of whom happen to be Cameroonian, the ARP was a means for Cameroonians of the diaspora displaced without reference to the transatlantic slave trade to rethink their responsibility to their home as their country celebrated its 50th anniversary since gaining independence from France. In the spirit of both Cameroon's national motto, pay to buy, pay to leave, and John F. Kennedy's famous rallying cry during his 1961 inaugural address, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. Um, the director of the NGO worked to bring peace to the global Cameroonian community by returning long lost Cameroonians, displaced through slavery, back to their land, the land of their ancestors. It just happens to be that the pragmatic way of facilitating this was through genetic ancestry. The ARP included many things. All expenses paid, transportation, and stays in Yaoundé Hilton, trips to shop for local fabric, as well as meetings with various government officials, including the Prime Minister having been in the country less than 24 hours. But what was of interest to many Americans, and has been of particular interest to myself over the years, were the, the fact that during this trip, um, there were plots of land in um, privately given, or with plots of land in Kribi privately donated as gifts to participants by a wealthy Cameroonian landowner. So the goal for me is often trying to situate what exactly do these land gifts suggest? Um, what do they do in trying to facilitate how one understands this DNA identity? And at the moment, um, and how those land, how the work around that land, those land gifts, be it the developments that are being made by Cam by Cam Americans. Um, at the moment, if there is to be anything. Um, well, if there is to be an answer, there hasn't really been anything to develop, to do, there hasn't been anything done. Um, when I turned to Cameroon in the summer 2013, I was surprised to find a surplus of weeds growing around the name tag, marking many of the plots. Um, they had appeared abandoned since I had last seen the area two years prior. The lack of direct action and presence in Cameroon, however, belied the discussions that have been taking place about how to deal with the land communally in the future. That June, a video conference was held, but the specter of China lurked in the background. As the Cam Americans began to discuss affordability and environmentalism of green technology model home, show, model home showcased in Yaoundé, the echoes of America attempting to maintain its position in the world against a rising superpower was impossible to ignore. Hadn't the U.S. recently given money to Cameroon, one woman asked, referring to the $77,000 the U.S. had approved to be allocated toward the Bimbia slave port restoration. At stake was not only the construction of home, Americans were also confronting the potential return to a home marked by increasing Chinese investment, or recently through the development of a port in the same town as the land plots. America was again facing the normal reality of China as a global power, but now through the latest African diasporic claims to the continent. And yet, with all this talk of the future, the impending challenge between China and African America my Cameroonian auntie reminded me over dinner that talking about big projects, of their projected growth, of their positive impact on Cameroon's economic development rarely materialized into the present. Despite the writing displaced, for instance, along the perimeter of the port, in both French and Chinese discussing the land in the hand, the hand in hand partnership of Cameroon and China, or the development ideas circulating amongst Cameroonians. It was not uncommon for Cameroonians to meet these promised futures with a disappointing or what would come to be pointed at an essence. On the one hand, the gifts of private property decentered DNA as the primary substance, according to which African Americans define their Cameroonian identity. On the other, however, the gifts of private property are opening up opportunities to reevaluate the terms according to which we attach the origins of ourselves to the double helix. Cameroon cannot be reduced to a pattern of nucleotides. The country and its and one's identity with that with it is not something to be rediscovered or reclaimed. Cameroon is as it has been in the making by parties and circumstances that can, can include but are not in no way solely dependent upon the relations produced through the transatlantic slave trade. What then are the implications of the convergence of Cameroonians fight for the future of their homeland as it pertains to both Cameroon and the United States? Just as Cameroonians find such futures in the end bloated and unsubstantiated. unsubstantiated. 
Does DNA suffice? <coughs> will the land will land ownership make up for the difference or any difference at all? The answer, if there is only one, remains to be seen. But one thing is for certain, what we can see is that there is a revisioning of identities underway. Well, thank you to both of you for this uh, thought-provoking um, talk. Uh, I want to briefly uh, provide you with a summary before I pass on to the audience. Um, it seems to me that Charlo uh, presented a sort of an historical... So, um, actually, a change of plan. So, what we'll do, I'll provide you with a summary, and then we'll take a short break. Uh, uh, we do have some food here, and, and then we'll return for uh, with our bell food food for a Q and A section. But uh, before we are going to break, I just want to briefly uh, 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 summarize uh, as Sherlock and Victoria's talk. Um, it seems to me that Sherlock did present a sort of a, a historical outline of this idea of uh, blackness, how it was constructed, and uh, I found it quite interesting, this um, uh, dialogue between um, Asian intellectuals and overall um, whites and intellectuals, particularly the case of uh, Furman, I was not aware of, and I will definitely look him up, and uh, it seems to me that it's quite an interesting book that needs to be uh, uh, fully read. I mean, this is a book that was written in 1886, and, and, and uh, he's definitely an avant-garde. So it's, it's quite interesting, and uh, he also pointed out how um, 80 was not locked himself by it, I mean the elite at least, the intellectuals, was not locked himself, but rather established vibrant connection with the intellectuals across the Atlantic world, in, in Paris, in Harvard, and other parts, so quite interesting. And, um, and, and, and one other interesting thing that I, um, uh, I found particularly um, interesting is, is this, um, how uh, American presence in it led the Asian, the Asian elite to reimagine themselves, to reimagine uh, re uh, um, uh, the identity. And, and while you were saying that, I kept thinking of uh, Jean-Paul Sartre, you know, this idea that your identity is imposed by your So it seems to me that that's an interesting example of a, a existentialist um, imposition, so to say. So I exist of the other, so, to say. so quite interesting. Um, Victoria's talk is also very, very, very interesting because she provides us with some components that uh, we often don't talk about. The invisible um, humanness, if you will. In, in, in what she was uh, describing in the case of, of uh, Cameroon, I kept thinking of great uh, books on a national identity, particularly Kennedy um, um, Anderson, who, whose book was like a, a breakthrough in, in anthropology, political science, and the social science in general. Kennedy uh, Anderson talks about how nation, it's not something that's solid, concrete, but rather it's the result of an imagination of the elite. And it seems to me that we are going through a process of reimagining or reimagining the nation in the Cameroon. And, and, and perhaps we'll see a sort of, you know, we can call it, uh, or this is just a suggestion, you may not, a genetic nation. In the, in the sense that uh, uh, how uh, the nation is now being uh, rethought to include the residual components across the Atlantic. So I, I find it and, and, and very, very, very interesting. But while, while you are explaining that, you know, I, I, I study political science. When you study political science, you study the power. And, and you tend to, to have this idea that nothing happens accidentally. There is always a process. So while you were saying that, I kept thinking, huh, so by extending citizenship in, onto African Americans, particularly those with uh, a lot of cultural and economic capital, to what extent is uh, the state in Cameroon, the state in Sierra Leone, try to uh, capitalize onto these same African Americans? Perhaps you know one day they may uh, uh, want to to look to create a sort of an ethnic lobby made by these uh, genetic citizens. 
So, you know, so I kept thinking that it, 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 there is an a, a, a interesting uh, uh, component. And the last thing that I, I want to, um, that I also think is your research is very interesting because it demystifies the idea quite common in the United States and other parts of the globe that Africa is one big country. Because with your own research, even African Americans can be pointed I am from a particular region of Africa. Instead of saying, oh, I'm from Africa. You know, we're talking about a big continent. So instead of saying, oh, I'm from Africa, or I descend from Africa, with this type of research, you know, an African American says, I am from a region X in West Africa. So instead of uh, 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 putting it as sort of um, Africa as one uh, big country. You know, even our former president, George Bush, once said, you know, you know, Africa is one big country, so we need to be really careful with this type yeah, of, uh, of uh, assumptions. So, um, with, with that, um, I conclude my summary. So, we are going to take a short break. Um, we have great food. We are going to eat, and, and while we eat, we can still uh, chit chat among ourselves, and then we can return for the question and answer session. Okay, thank you. So at this time, um, I'll be asking you to um, ask the panelists questions. When you are asking questions, I um, please go straight to the point and tend not to um, take uh, a lot of time in order to give opportunity to others who may want to ask questions as well. So we'll take the first three questions and then um, the panelists will respond them. And we'll take, we'll take the second batch of another three more questions. Any takers? I'm curious about the, the impact in terms of hate burning identity. Um, and of course, you mentioned this some generational differences in terms of identity um, with the Black Lives Matter um, and the involvement of Cape Verdeans in the Black Lives Matter actions and ongoing organizing. Okay. Second question? Another question? I also have another question for you, which has to do with Cameroon um, identity and the um, detested genetic testing. Um, the effect of, you talk about their being able to locate sort of what region of Africa, let's say for instance, that you came from. But what about migration patterns? Mm -hmm. The migration, the Bantu migration down from, you know, and the effect of that, because you could be genetically, have been somebody living in Africa, but genetically came from in terms of that. So if they looked at the effect of African migration patterns on um, relationship to genetic testing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the impact that would have, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir? Hi, um, my question is This is awesome, by the way. This is awesome. I'm a Congolese poet and I do a lot in the community here. My question is how do you implement the connection? Because I know you would like to explain the connection between West Africa and the United States and the Caribbean, right? So, how do you implement this connection at the school system level, especially at historical black colleges? I study at Fisk University. You know, I was born in the Congo and connected to the continent and back and forth. But I think for me, the frustration was the gap, the disconnect. You know, and even when we speak of Africa, West Africa is mainly usually portrayed as the most essential part of the continent. But I think now is with the wonderful lecture you gave. I think what are some of the ways to sort of implement those information at the educational level system? For to bridge gap and to have multi generational dialogue and stuff like that. Okay, so <clears throat> we're going to respond to first uh, these three questions and then uh, I will ask again for another set of questions. Um, but since the first question is regarding the impact of a virgin identity or uh, this historical debate that 
happening within the Israeli community onto the black... Yeah, uh, contemporary. Contemporary black, political uh, Yes. This is quite interesting, and as I mentioned earlier, um, we find three major strands of um, Israeli identity today. So Israeli men, those who, who uh, live in the United States. And, and, and uh, there's another thing that I need to point is, um, while I make sense of this uh, concept, Israeli American, the uh, group itself is not totally homogeneous. We do find generational difference. For instance, this day there is a gap between uh, uh, second and third generation Cape Verdeans and those who recently moved from 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 Cape Verde. So it's not a totally homogeneous uh, social group, and it is yet to create a one common voice. Uh, but this is uh, for another debate. What um, to respond to your question? Um, um, I want to say that um, you do find um, among the youth, particularly, a strong connection with um, African American culture, especially you know in regard to hip hop, which is uh, a form of cultural manifestation that has penetrated heavily among youth, not only Cape Verdeans but uh, among um, other other. Um, all the social uh, uh, groups, and, uh, and and it seems to me at least obviously I don't I, I'm not I didn't do any research on the issue of uh, Black Lives Matter, but it seems to me that one of the key component of this movement, or in a way, it is linked with with the um, hip hop, or at least uh, it seems to me that some of the artists that are, are trying to put up in in musical format the whole movement. So what I want to say is. There might be a strong connection between this uh, social movement, this uh, Black Lives Matter, with the young generation, mainly through um, through the hip hop, the identification with hip hop culture, or uh, the fact that the same um, youth face the same problem as African Americans. They are, you know, uh, especially, you know, we are here in Rochester. Uh, uh, if we just go around and ask. Um, um, you, um, youth of the Cape American community, I am quite sure that they will perhaps tell you the same story that we find um, among African Americans. You know, the same uh, inner city kind of uh, uh, social economic problems. I don't know if I respond to your question. Yeah, you did. You did respond. So um, perhaps you know, we can um, address so Yeah. Um, so I mean, you bring up a really great point about okay. So if we take into consideration the fact that people have been mobile on the continent, uh, particularly mm -hmm. like when we're dealing with the time period, you know, mm -hmm. prior to slavery, which is uh, for the most part what people are trying to engage with um, when using these markers to identify right. origin, uh, then the picture becomes much more complicated, right? right? Like mm -hmm. it means even the notion that one can identify with these specific countries is also in some way right. and very often denied also, for instance, like the carving out of Africa without reference to African practices around language, history, right. I mean, the the whole I mean, it's arbitrary, it's not arbitrary carving out, right. um, via colonial history. Mm -hmm. um, and that is one thing that is often been coming up when scholars try to address this. I mean, so this is one of those like, it's kind of the power dynamic of how knowledge is produced. Right. Um, particularly when it comes to, for instance, not only like in the commercial business yeah. of genetic ancestry, but also in scientific practices and how we make these ancestrally informative markers. I mean, can we say they're ancestrally informed, but according to whom and for whom, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, and it's interesting with that point, you find oftentimes that even though you have a um, all these companies that offer, you know, information to one's ancestry, none of them necessarily will reference the yeah. same markers. Um, it's there's no particular kind of um, standard mm -hmm. that each one follows, mm -hmm. um, and so this is like a point that often comes up with genealogists who are merging this uh, DNA testing with, say, archival research. Mm -hmm. So. I'm taking what people talk about in terms of like depth. What is the depth of DNA? How far can you go or where what are you doing with it? Um, and it becomes in one this is where in some ways the question of choice comes in. So it's like choice on behalf of the company, which how many markers are you gonna use, which ones are they? So you can come up with your specific model of ancestry to give to the customer who wants to pay for it. Right? So that's one part. 
But the other component is also, at a certain point, when if you have, for instance, like, um, with the genealogists I work with, many of them have taken multiple genetic ancestry tests with multiple companies. And so, and have seen, like, there are different answers to this very same question that they are asking with this test. Um, and so it's also a matter of consumer, or like, to make that choice in some respect. Like, what are you going to do? Like, what story are you going to tell? Um, and that's at the end of the day what a lot of this is about. It's, it's about storytelling. It's about what choices are made of what we are or are not going to say and how we're going to fit it into these different kind of parts of ourselves to make sense of us. Um, and it's, I think in that respect it offers a means of reflecting on what these subtle power dynamics are embedded with DNA and how it circulates. Um, and gives us an opportunity, as you were pointing out, you know, how does this reflect on DNA? It suggests that maybe we should not be, we should be very careful about how much truth yeah. we give exactly. to DNA in and exactly. of itself. That's we need what to I make was... sure to put it in its That's context. Right. Right. And so, like, for with the project I'm trying to do, in one respect, is dealing with that genealogy question in the laboratory stuff, which I didn't talk about today, but also taking very seriously <coughs> what is happening when we take it out of, like, the African American diasporic experience, when it's not just here in the United States, where we're not just having the situated solely in the Transatlantic Slave <clears throat> particularly as it was a, as it was experienced or dealt with here in the United States. What happens when we have to deal with other people, other countries, other contexts, other politics, and not using that solely as something to be like, oh no, now it's not a matter of like, I don't know who I am. Now there's like, oh, I'm unauthentic or somehow like, it, but taking seriously, like, what do those tensions really showcase, and how can they be productive for taking seriously what we need to do in order to reconnect, quote unquote. So, yeah. Thank you. Uh, I think part of your question alluded to the connection between uh, Haiti and uh, West Africa about lack of information at the educational level. Yeah. And also, I think you mentioned how do we implement something to make sure that the information is uh, shared. Right. So, the couple of you from Congo? Yeah, I was born in the Congo, the um, Kinshasa, yeah. Right. Quick thing, so, to share, for example, in the 1960s, as uh, Haitian intellectuals were fleeing the Dubali regime, yeah. a lot of them took on an offer by the United Nations to travel to those newly decolonized African country from the 50s and the 60s to become uh, teachers and uh, educators. Mm -hmm. So a lot of them actually made uh, their uh, way to uh, Africa, particularly sitting out in uh, Congo, our best Haitian storyteller, yeah. uh, Moe Sixto, actually was well known as an educator. Okay. So that was uh, one recent connection. But what I would say, it took me to come here in the US to investigate and find out about the fact that W. Dubois, his father, yeah. was from Haiti, that Frédéric Douglas was ambassador to uh, Haiti, that uh, Malcolm X, who made the statement that he wanted to learn about Susan Gershu and Desalin and others. So there's something to be said about the fact that in all those countries for, formerly colonized, say by France, usually the power structure involves people who either travel to France to become scholars and are still writing from the lens of the former colonials. Mm -hmm. Or uh, lack of uh, interaction, say with the US or from England or Spain, doesn't give them a chance to have the full picture. <coughs> there is such a rich body of scholarly information here in the US at the Boston Public Library we have close to 10,000 pieces of documents and letters that don't exist in Haiti or in France. It's all about Haiti. We had recently a three Muslim exhibit on Toussaint Louverture at the library. So all of this to say that on one hand, if in our country, say in Haiti, in Haiti, there is not this political will to redesign the whole educational curricula, to make sure that it involves all of those different missing pieces. So that's one actually action item that might be difficult, that calls for actually more uh, in-depth and uh, long-term negotiating with the power structure or with the state. So that's one of them. The second thing that comes to mind, as we Haitians or Africans or African Americans are here in the US, we reach out to some of those progressive African American leaders who wants to learn, 
So, not to put anyone on the spot, my friend Barry Dinner <laughs> is some kind of expert on scholar on Haitian history or art. Mm -hmm. You also traveled to Haiti in the early 1990s. Yeah, exactly. What's when you begin, sorry? Cardina. Cardina, right. Yes, with the New England delegation on Haiti. Right, after uh, our steed was. Correct. Perfect. Brenda Robinson went on the hunger strike right. for Haiti. Catherine Dunham did the same thing when she was uh, 90. Baron Rashid, also So I'm saying, as those African American leaders travel to Haiti, learn more, they are able to impact policies both here in the US mm -hmm. and in Haiti. So we may have this duty to continue reaching out to them. As I say, I don't necessarily view myself as African, but we share this common background that allows mm -hmm. us to communicate more and learn about uh, each other. And finally, I do believe that besides from reaching out to them, the kind of advocacy and activism that we are doing here at the local level to strengthen our organizations may contribute to this exchange of information. Uh, we can take another set of questions. Yes. Uh, I want to ask a sort of invite comment on a sort of compound question. It's that uh, there is a dialogic relationship between black and African over a long period of time. There are moments when the two equal each other and moments when they don't. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are points where the definitions are clearly political mm -hmm. uh, in a kind of global consideration. Uh, for example, the way in which from the 60s forward, as part of responding to the post-colonial era, uh, we use African uh, as claiming a whole place in the global order. Uh, and then there's the use of black to get around the question of nationalities, because very often you want to uh, harvest this experience <coughs> that is a kind of global black experience in relationship to colonial power, but it exists in chapters determined by different colonial moments. So I'd like to just invite some exploration of these relationships of uh, black and African as uh, identities. Two more questions? I have another question, and I don't even know how to frame the question, but it has to do with, um, you know, identity and um, challenging the strong anti-black, anti-African uh, system, uh, not only in this country, but in the globe. And um, sort of uh, your sort of uh, chat, your perspective about how, what we need to do in terms of sort of either pan-African as a movement in terms of addressing that. That's a wonderful question. It's funny, I'm, I'm actually part of the, the movement trying to bridge that gap, you know, mm -hmm. on the international level, local, because it's, the ignorance is a, is a bliss, and yes. it's deep. There's yes. so much disconnection. Right. I was going to ask you in terms of the, um, what is it, genetic ancestry? Mm -hmm. What is an effective, okay, how can this, how can, oh, sorry, I'm trying to put the question. How can um, genetic ancestry can be used effectively to bridge the gap between continental African and the African diaspora, like the African American community? Mm -hmm. I know that hip hop is a huge vehicle, and growing up in Gabon and Senegal, all this country, hip hop is huge. And I think to have a multi generational dialogue to bridge the gap, it's important, but I think. There's so much disconnect. This is the welcome information is wonderful. The history, the historical implications is very wonderful. But I think there's a to, to go back to a point. There's a modern day Africa, which is you know, on an international level, this like the animosity is real. You know, the gap is there. Yeah. And I think genetic ancestry is, a, is one way. But in terms of an effective tool, mm -hmm. I don't think about this one of them. You know, that like how that is. How does DNA, how can DNA kind of operate in that? Right, right, and I, you know, because it's one thing to say, oh, boom, okay, I'm from the U.S., I find out I'm in Cameroon, my connection, you go to Yaoundé in Cameroon, get in contact with the local population, and they speak French, and you know, the black French speaking where I come from. 
can mm -hmm. say, well, this has nothing to do with what's going on here. I don't see how can we bridge the gap, yeah. you know what I mean? So it's either are we doing it from an African-American perspective, right. or if you're going to connect, because there's so much involved in terms of geographical location, cultural differences, and stuff like that. No, 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 you're right. Yeah, yeah. Awesome question. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. Okay, so uh, we have three questions. Um, uh, I will try to address the first one and then I'll add two for you. Um, actually, I, I find it pretty interesting in your, your concept of dialogic black and African while you are exposing your thoughts. I kept thinking of this uh, great transformation on this ideology of Pan Africanism that took place in the late 1950s and 1960s. When we talk about Pan Africanism, we are talking about a social theory in ideology that um, sought to unite people of Africa and African descent. However, um, this great transformation that I mentioned, which again uh, led to the split between Africa and Black, uh, can be exemplified by the distinction between Du Boisian Pan Africanism, which was essentially Pan Negroism, the unification of Black people across the globe in Africa, in diaspora, versus Unquamilukuma Pan-Africanism, which has a, a statesman, has a man of state, sought to unify the continent, including Black Africa and White Africa. And in fact, a Muslim uh, a, who recently passed away, uh, one of the, uh, perhaps we can call him, can call him the Dean of African Political Science. Muslim um, writes how Unquamilukuma symbolically represent uh, continental pan-Africanism. By rejecting, or at least by uh, putting as uh, something for later, the diasporic connection and focusing on the continental unification. It was not um, a coincidence that Nkrumah's wife, for instance, uh, was from Egypt. This is just to bridge the connection between black Africa and white Africa. So, uh, in a way, what I want to um, uh, say is in the 1960s that we find was at least the development of this distinction between being black and being African. And, and a, a good way of looking at it by looking at the politics of Pan African um, unity uh, following the thoughts and political practice of um, Ghana's uh, common group. Okay. So, um, maybe you want to. At a point or two, or you can just uh... just touching based on what you mentioned uh, before about uh, Africans and Black side, <coughs> just a few comments where the terms have been defined in relation, as you mentioned, mm -hmm. to certain historical uh, events. I mentioned, for example, the at time the U.S. occupation led Haitians to redefine themselves in relation to their connections to Africa, but as before, they were just identifying themselves as the, they are free men. Even as you speak now, Haitians don't necessarily view themselves as black in relation to some other countries that just happen from, to be from this ancillary country or island where they are black. The other thing that I think that should also be considered is at that time, this definition is uh, shaped by views from others who are supportive of blacks. The perfect example is that the term or the concept of negritude or blackness found strong support from Jean Paul Sartre and André Gide, that considered as the father of uh, surrealism in France. Now, as they were writing about negritude being uh, anti-racism, racism, for example, as uh, Jean Paul Sartre was asking beautiful in production to an um, anthology book by Leopold Sidar Senghor, who felt validated by the fact that French and Rousseau, a great uh, ex existentialist, was writing about his book. <coughs> Further down the line, you found other intellectuals and scholars from the Caribbean islands contesting the fact that Leopold Sidar Senghor would take pride being defined by Jean Paul Sartre, even in a supportive way. So there would be some of the scholars who took actually the opposite uh, approach, saying, I don't need to be defined as black because some white scholar decided that this is great to be black, that you're asserting yourself. And one famous quote is that, 
the tiger doesn't have to identify or to prove his tigerness. You just have to jump on his prey and then do what he has to do. So either at time historical movement or ideological or philosophical movements such as surrealism may uh, shape how actually people separate out being blacks or being Africans. And uh, touching this on something else that I heard, I really think that ultimately education or revamping again so many of those current curricula right. both here in the US yeah. to prepare the next generation yeah. to be less mentally brainwashed. Yeah. Because even as we as uh, Africans, African American nations, are saying there are something wrong, at times we are reacting to something else. So the discourse is not really objective because it's still a discourse in relation to something else that happened in the past or to some other great scholars who want to support us in our so-called emancipation movement from their perspective. I guess, um, so it just makes me think about, so how do we rethink this, like, Dialogue, the notion of a dialogic relationship, right? Because again, like we say things that it's or we communicate with one each other, but we're not necessarily always on the same terms. Yeah. Um, at any given time in history, or even across time, across space. <clears throat> and I guess like one of the things I keep thinking about in my work, but also maybe in my own kind of like politics, um, is in what ways is it productive to really kind of like do the work so that we are not, I mean, we can't keep having the same dialogue. Yes, it's important to know our history, but at right. what point are we gonna be doing or saying something new? Mm -hmm. um, and so I guess I, I, like for instance, for me, I, I guess like, at t so this is maybe just like reflecting on other times I've given talks about my work. There are people who like mourn, like, oh, um, people can't really know, or like, oh, it can't be quite Cameroonian or whatever. And I don't find that, I don't find that something to mourn. I find that those spaces, that like inability to be one thing, be so productive for moving forward. Um, but not, but the thing is, what we have to be careful of is not moving forward via an erasure of one another. So in what ways do we allow in order maybe not, or like how do we allow each other to have our separate terms, but like allow that to be productive for coming together and going forward. And that requires a lot of listening, that requires a putting away of ego. Um, and so for me, that's why like, for instance, like I talk about in my talk, like this flagging of like what sounds like neo-imperialism, but yeah. via, you know, the notions of like pan-African and like blackness. Um, so unity, solidarity, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it's in those kind of moments where, like, speaking to your question, like, how are we going to dismantle, like, anti-black, um, anti-African um, racism, you know, pretty much like global white supremacy? Mm -hmm. um, it's not just attacking, say, Europe. It's not just attacking the police state in the United right. States. Yeah. It's also dealing with like internal, like the way these things are internalized and the ways we come Thank at you. each other, yeah, exactly. the way we connect with one another. Right. Um, I mean, I guess that, but then that also kind of leads to your question, right? So, how, in what ways can DNA ancestry be productive, right? Like, how can we use this as an effective means for bridging, bridging a gap? Yeah. Um, and for me, that comes from like basic, like doing the work to make sure that blackness cannot be the only thing connecting us. Because at some point that becomes a void. Like, and not dealing, so maybe this, and I'm saying that via, say, like, Audrey Moore's notion of, like, precaution, like, unity is not unanimity. Like, it doesn't mean that we have to be completely the same for us to come together. And so, in what ways can we come together and, like, be aware of, like, the shit, like, there are things that we share, for instance, like, um, um, oppression, and uh, particularly historically, who has done it to whom, and you know, we've done it to each other. I mean, it's like, can we learn from, like, for instance, the history of Liberia? Right. I know in Cameroon, like, that's constantly the spec, like, that is a thing, for instance, like, government officials are trying to figure out how one is right. invested in all of this. It's a specter of Liberia that's constantly hanging in the background. Okay, so, like, okay, what do we... 
I guess my thing is like, can we come up with a pan Africanism of the day that is allowed in some capacity, like thinking about Black Lives Matter, that like all lives matter as they are without having to do the work of conforming one to any to like politically correct notion of how one is supposed to be, and doing the work with like the various. Because the thing is, we're all also not necessarily on the same power. Like, their power dynamics invested in this. So like, you have to take seriously talking about like reconnecting versus like African American. Cameroonians, like the United States is space, like spot in the global hierarchy. And it's not, it's not just a matter, of, and so with that, it's also like who's indebted to whom or how do you even think about debt to one another? That's one thing. Um, how do we think about the fact like, you know, it's important to acknowledge certain things like transatlantic slave trade happened, colonialism happened, those two things are intertwined in ways that like oftentimes are not talked about. How do we have that dialogue? But how do we also understand that, like, in certain respect, there's only so much we can give to one another to accordingly like, correct that? I mean, how do we talk about correcting like genocide? How do we talk about like, that's? It almost does, it does disrespect to the actual experience to presume that there's some quantifiable means of doing that and for us to be able to do that to one another. Okay, but like, how do we nevertheless hold that difference and still? Respect one another in that difference to move forward in a common goal. Um, I think DNA ancestry offers an opportunity to be a, it's an open space to have that possibility there. And that's one of the things I at least like find hope in the fact that there hasn't, Cam Americans haven't done anything quite yet. Yeah. Um, and I think it's because people are trying to be thoughtful, okay, how does one strategically maneuver this? Um, I don't know, did that answer your question? Yeah, I'm not, I mean, we can talk no, about it more. Right, right. Like, I just have another just, question if, if, if it's in the yeah. right answer. Nobody has to ask another question. Okay, I guess we can take the last three questions. Um, last one. Last one question. Okay. Last question, okay, so uh, the last question, uh, uh, try to be as brief as possible. Yes. My question is connected to his question, like um, how would like the genetic testing could connect it to like the origin back in Africa or whatever. So like with that means that every like most countries in Africa, the most most of them are like getting soaked in to the American culture. Mm -hmm. So like you said there's gonna be like a possibility where they could actually figure out who they are or whatnot. So like the American culture kind of like takes away from that. So in a way they will always kind of be lost. Uh -huh. Yeah, no, no, like, again, so it, it's like, I, so this is kind of like one of the things why I said, like, in the paper, like, it's not about, it's like, how do we talk about career connecting without also having to, like, revoke this on terms of recovery or rediscover, like, rediscover or something? Um, like, loss is okay. <laughs> um, are we willing to make space for that? Um, again, I just, it's, I mean, there's something beautiful and again, very productive for holding out the possible, like the nuances of how various countries, various groups, like have changed over time, you know, like it allows the possibility of how we rethink ourselves accordingly when we think of ourselves as distinct from, I mean, that's, it's not about keeping things static or people static or countries static. Um, I mean, it's via keeping things still or in some box that you have things like that, you know, you have things like slavery, colonialism, imperialism, so do we really want to continue that? Um, I, don't know, I think there needs to be a reevaluation of how we mourn history, um, how we situate loss, how we situate loss as the defining factor, particularly the defining factor of how that we come to know one another. Um, so I guess in regards to your question, um, there's absolutely loss, but I don't think the loss is a hindrance to what we can do um, individually as well as collectively. Um, I think it's just respecting those terms, those differences. Okay, so now we reach the point uh, from Unfortunately, you know, how the good thing must end at one moment. Uh, 
from my side and uh, from the panelists, I want to appreciate your presence and your input. Your questions are certainly relevant. Let me to can go in and, and give more thoughts on these issues. Right. Um, so uh, I, I want perhaps to give the, um, the panelists um, a chance to say one last thing uh, about the issue of who is African and uh, who is black before I turn in the, the, um, to the chairman. Sorry, one may want to say one last word, or maybe not. I don't know. I don't want to pressure you. <laughs> um, just I guess um, it's not just we Africa. The blackness is not just one thing, and I think the work is in allowing those other possibilities of how we know blackness and an African identity to flourish and flourish together without compromising one for the other, because it's a false dichotomy. And yeah, to me it has always been about accepting that within a particular concept there should be or there has been some level of uh, diversity and to resist uh, the urge of uh, judging and staying or alive. labeling okay. uh, others who may feel and live and experience right. their African identity or their black identity mm -hmm. uh, differently. Ultimately, as a black individual with African ancestry, there is always a level of uh, hardship, of oppression that we've all known that allows us uh, to connect. There is always this perception by others of who we are or who we should be that should help us further move. So those should be the, I think, bottom line that we should build on and not, uh, again, looking at others who may take a different path to right. get to the same point. So Jennifer, you are Stephanie. I would like to just say thank you to all of you. I feel very blessed as the one person here. I think this uh, not obviously um, to have been. Oh yes, yeah, you are. Actually, you are. Oh yeah, yes, you are. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, as a cradle. <laughs> <laughs> oh, really? like genesis of everyone. Yeah. Such a <laughs> planet. Rich and wonderful discussion. And please tell people who weren't here that you think might be interested that they'll be able to see the video of the production. Thank you to James Boyd, who is here doing the filming.